Hello, Dickie. There were kindred spirits. Say hello to James. Famous, good looking, what's not to like? And meet Barry. What everybody else wanted to be. Hunt and Sheen. Women wanted them. The 1970s was their playing field. Give me a drink, give me a drink. Your fitness came from driving or riding. <laughs> or shagging. You had to have big balls to do it. When motor racing was dangerous and sex was safe. Bang. We are a society smitten by celebrity. It's what sells. It's like torturing people. And the best is a sports star. Define a sports star. We at Nike amplify the voice of the athlete. I just jump in and give it our sense, you know. Sex and race morning. It would be hundreds in a year. Wow. <laughs> Playboy was a masterpiece of understatement. When the race finishes, instead of chasing girls as we did in my day, now they go and say thanks to Vodafone. What are your immediate plans now? I should be getting drunk. I really want to go out and make my mark in the motorcycle racing world. And I don't want to make any marks on the circuit at the same time. As he was my brother, he was a little shit. <laughs> Barry Sheen was born in London in 1950 to parents Iris and Frank. Barry was prone to asthma attacks which disappeared when he was allowed to do what he wanted. We lived where Dad worked and there was a big yard at the back and Barry learnt to ride a little bike there. Do you just want to get a level? Get a level there. So if I say shucks and fuck and all that sort of I stuff... Oh dear. Well I'll, yeah, well, I'll cancel it then. Can we yeah, rub that out? We can. <laughs> Whatever the game was, whatever the sport was, he had to win. Otherwise, it was tears and anger for several days. So he obviously had that ingrained very early on. Educated at the exclusive Wellington Public School, James Simon Wallace Hunt was a gifted all-round athlete. His mother described him as a headstrong young man. It was on his mate's 18th birthday, and the treat was to go to Silverstone and see these racing cars. And he came back, said, I've been to Silverstone today. I'm going to be a racing driver, and I'm going to be world champion. He hated school. He didn't think much of authority at all. I don't think he liked to be told what to do. James didn't like restriction or authority at school or anywhere else. That carried on probably till he quit racing, actually. The teenage Hunt worked numerous jobs to make the money to buy his first Mini Cooper racing car. His next step would be Formula 3. Sheen was a skilled mechanic by the age of 16, spending his summers loving life on the road as the motorcycling circuit travelled around Europe. He became involved with Dad building bikes and what have you, and Dad had riders that rode for him. And I think once he got to about teenage years, he said to Dad one day, let me ride one of the bikes, I'm sure I could do better than them. And so that's how it really, I think, it began. If ever I got irritated with James, and I used to get very irritated with James, I always reminded myself that there was a very nice bloke hiding inside. Barry got on well with anybody from royalty down to the dustman. It was impossible to dislike Barry. It was possible to dislike James. He crashed an awful lot. You know, that was his, his problem. Three words, hunt the shunt. James was a huge adrenaline man. If you sat on the side of his car before the Grand Prix, you would have think the engine was running, but the engine wasn't running. He was just rattling. He was just rattling the whole car. He would vomit frequently before races and occasionally during. He used to have a bucket for him to throw up into. The young Hunt's reckless approach did not amuse the motor racing establishment. Boxing commentators were more impressed. He wanted to stand back for a while, let him calm down as several marshals and other drivers found to their cost. He's decked the flag, Marshal! James just knocked him down. Unbelievable! He wouldn't have caught me, I'll tell you. I wouldn't have been that close. I'd run away. Um, he was volatile. Let's put, let's put it like that. The young Sheen's progress was more serene. At 21, he was a Grand Prix winner. By 1974, Sheen had graduated to the elite class of 500cc motorcycling. Dad Franco was now his mechanic. Hunt found his patriarch in the unlikely shape of a lord of the manor. 
This private jet ranger helicopter, piloted by a Vietnam veteran, ferries the ample frame of Lord Hesketh from the battlefields of Grand Prix racing. He was 24, 25 at the time, and I think he got bitten by the Formula One bug. Le Patron, as he likes to be called, inherited his title at the age of five. My life's ambition is to, is to win the world championship. Alexander Hesketh had a large fortune and a low boredom threshold. He described Formula One as a flat bottle of champagne in need of a rather good shake. And I remember I arrived at Brands Hatch for the first meeting that James was going to be in, and his lordship and the rest of them were there with a Rolls Royce, champagne and caviar and all the fine things of life. And I thought, well, this is a bit of a rum do. Well, that's absolutely fantastic. We were all the sort of boring, hard-nosed professionals. He would turn up dressed all in white, and he would start in the pits with a glass of champagne to settle his stomach, as he put it. It has a, an atmosphere of the old-type Grand Prix teams, and uh, I think that anything truly British deserves supporting. It was a sort of uh, jolly wheeze to have a Formula One team. We don't want any pictures! We don't want any pictures! <laughs> They had this playboy image. They needed someone to amuse Lord Hesketh, and James was the boy. So James was like their, their pet monkey to me on a chain that was the amusement for the Lord. Fantastic, Mutley. The feeling among the professional teams was that if he could be made to concentrate on his talent and work seriously, he'd succeed. Poodle? Poodle? In his early days with Hesketh, he did far better than anyone expected him to. The monkey and the organ grinder had their first podium finish in just their ninth race. Then at the Dutch Grand Prix in 1975, Hunt and Hesketh triumphed. A year later, Hesketh had departed almost as quickly as he'd arrived. Never had F1 been as much fun. Certainly without Hesketh, I was really on the way out in racing. My career was in a terrible state. He picked me up off the floor. As the press surround the couple, James Hunt introduces his fiancée, Susie. People like Barry Sheen and James Hunt, they started to become playboys. They started to become, if you like, stars over and above the sport. If you're a tabloid editor, you basically you've died and gone to heaven, haven't you? The emergence of Sheen and Hunt coincided with the rise and rise of the Red Tops, the tabloid press. At Brompton Oratory for a Grand Prix wedding. Hunt's wedding to model Susie Miller was national news. A girl in a million, says James. Colour television had arrived. Sports star had met celebrity. This marriage was built to last. It doesn't look very well, does it? It was as hot, as hot, as hot. I definitely would have published the Max Mosley story. And they don't care about the consequences. Barry, all the very best. Thanks for talking to us. That's OK. Hello, Dickie. And back to Dickie in the studio. <laughs> Hello, Barry. How are you, my son? Good luck. Come on, England! No, 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 no! There is a huge appetite for exposing sports stars. A sports star has to be on their guard morning, noon and night. If our footballers are partying, they're in big trouble now. In the 1970s, James Hunt's latest liaison would have been reported first in the society pages. Today, the private lives of sports rich and famous are newsworthy events that can run and run. It started when we started paying our athletes these insane amounts of money and that created this image of who they are and what they are and how important they are. Today's star footballers have been elevated to the status of demigods. What impression would you have of yourself? Wouldn't you think that you were somehow kind of special? We are a society smitten by celebrity, you know, whether it's good or bad. When I edited The Sun, 
I was more interested in celebrity. I was very interested in kiss and tell, very interested in sex generally, I must be honest with you. When we stuck it on the front page, the sale went up. Oh, what a goal! Yeah, yeah, yeah. We live in this world of media which pays five million a year instead of the 250,000 pounds that he's actually, his talent is actually worth. You can't take that money and say, oh, I'm a completely private individual. Playing his football behind closed doors or for a pub, he can do whatever he likes. People want to know everything that the football stars do in the bedroom. That's, you know, that's the Brits. We love the private lives of everybody else. Well, I've certainly played a part in that, but obviously it's an editor or a publisher that decides what goes in the papers, and it's the public that decide what they want. If they don't want it, they don't buy it. Sport is massive for tabloids. Just look at John Terry. You'd be very surprised if you saw a big sports story and it was still just on the back page. You'd be astonished. So that has definitely moved, and the reason it moved is because the customer wanted it to move. You took the news of the world to court for gross invasion of privacy. What happened? I won. In 2008, the News of the World released pictures of Max Mosley engaged in sadomasochistic acts with five sex workers, alleging a Nazi role-playing game, which Mosley denied. But of course, the truth of it is that once it's out, there's no judge in the world can take it out of the public mind again. They want to sell their newspapers, so they publish this sort of thing in order to sell newspapers. They pretend that, ah, you know, he's pretending to be a family man, so we're going to expose his hypocrisy. It's nonsense. They're the ones who are hypocrites. I definitely would have published the Max Mosley story, yes. If any chief executive were found guilty of such, or it appeared in the papers, they wouldn't be around two minutes. Why does Mosley think that his actions are above the common thought process of reasonable people? They realise that they can sell newspapers with this sort of thing, so they do it. And they don't care about the consequences. Watching uh, Mosley weeping about his lot in life, in which he's held this rather dark and disgusting secret, is one of the more laughable aspects. It's like torturing people. And the best is a sports star. driving that James Hunt hopes will bring him his second Grand Prix victory of the season. If Barry Sheen and James Hunt were world champions today, their sex lives would be all over the papers just the way that the football stars had been. It's only because in the 70s it was a far more gentle time that they could get away with it. They couldn't now. If you got killed tomorrow, what would you miss most? <laughs> mm. Yeah, that's tricky. <clears throat> I'm not allowed to talk about that on telly. <laughs> By 1975, Hunt and Sheen were established contenders on their Grand Prix circuits. I'm very happy to say the least. <laughs> Mixing in the same circles, they became close friends, united by their sporting ambition and a passionate dedication to enjoy every minute of their climb to the top. Are we now on the air? Playboy wasn't simply an image. It was a lifestyle choice. Thank you. James had an embroidered thing on his overalls which said, Sex, the breakfast of champions. Nowadays, it couldn't possibly happen. The modern ethos, you know, no sex the day before, I think James boohooed that one. James was definitely sex on race morning, yeah. <laughs> sex on race day? Before, during and after, if possible. Oh! And certainly Barry Sheen. But it was the 70s, wasn't it? Well, drink it, not bar for it. Short skirts and uh, sex, drug and rock and roll. You'd still have a glass of wine the night before. It wouldn't be in the gym all day long. Your fitness came from driving or riding, whatever you're doing, or shagging. And the foils of victory to Barry Sheen. I've never been one of the guys who have been totally focused and very serious and, and, and just having racing in my life. I always thought I also have a life. And this, especially these good two guys, they had a lot, a lot of life. I always thought also it's very important to have all this life, but still succeed and still deliver. 
This was why these two persons was very big for me because they delivered. Both been one of the greatest at the time and still didn't miss out anything. Hunt's legendary success with the opposite sex may have been underestimated. The latest unauthorized biography claims to have done the definitive piece of totting up. Total number of conquests? I worked it out about 5,000. And that's different ones. I don't think he was in Warren Beatty's class, but um, he was certainly the top Brit. Is it necessary to abstain from drink and sex in order to win? You have to abstain from drink because the alcohol tires your body out, you see? Do you get tired of sex? And no, no, nor do I. Well, there you go. Whether it was an air stewardess, whether it was a girl organising the race meeting, whether it was a secretary of somebody you'd met, it was fair game, whatever. There was lots and lots, yeah, it would be hundreds uh, in a year. And this was over what period of time? Ah, uh, when did Stephanie get involved? <laughs> this is how I first came to know who Barry was. Early in 1975, Barry Sheen's growing popularity attracted the attention of a documentary film crew. Half each side you can do this, and it's better really. Their mission was to capture a month in the life of motorcycling's young star. Hey, you send the contract through the post, OK? Yeah, I hope I win so I can get the extra 500,000. From Daytona International Speedway. The centerpiece of the documentary's filming was to be Sheen's appearance at the renowned Daytona circuit in America. Coming off the North Bank, they said it's still damp down there. Is it? Yeah. Oh, Barry never made the start line. They were filming him testing at Daytona. Something happened. Doesn't look very well, does he? Don't take it off. God, he was lucky, really, because um, it was a horrendously fast accident. He didn't appear to lose consciousness at any time. He was very coherent. In fact, he was chasing the emergency room nurse verbally, of course. Barry was filmed laying in his hospital bed. I got a broken femur, I think you call it. He got a broken this and a broken that and a broken something else. I busted my uh, wrist just here, my forearm, some ribs, a couple of vertebrae. This was on this documentary and Stephanie saw it. Taken a lot of skin off, all in the wrong places. This is the best bit. Other than that, I feel brand new. <laughs> oh, wow. This is the fracture that Barry sustained. He then became like the bionic man. Everybody wanted to know about his bits of metal here and plates there and probably boosted his career, if anything. That's when the public really latched on to everything that he was and everything that he represented and became more and more interested in motorcycle racing. And what did Barry see in Stephanie? Uh, that was a silly question. He knew who I was straight away. The mark of a man. He says, you're the girl on the Old Spice ad. Give him Old Spice now. She wanted to do a photo shot with somebody with some leathers and she'd seen Barry Sheen in the newspapers and thought that would be the bloke to do it with. And that was it, really. We um, hit it off straight away. Stephanie's lovely. She's beautiful. She's everything that we'd all love to be. 
That's what Barry saw in Stephanie. Unfortunately, she was married to someone else at the time. That did not deter Britain's new bionic man. My husband went to the rags with it, and I don't know why he did that, because it made himself look stupid. I'd never seen anything like it. It was quite shocking, really. All of a sudden, this guy came up to us and he said, oh, I'm from the news of the world. And I said, oh, hi, I'm from Putney. <laughs> we would have made a lot of money out of it, I suppose, selling our stories and all this nonsense. But there was none of that back then. What about marriage? How is that going to change, first of all, your image? Um, I think if you're in love with someone, it's more important than an image. That's the way I look at it anyway. We didn't get married for eight, nine like years. Do you like it? No, you'll never change. I don't want to change him either. <laughs> he never did change. Beautiful model meets British hero. It was a fairy tale. I suppose they'd be posh and becks of the day. They made a glamorous couple, I think. She was a very important part of Barry's life. Barry and Stephanie were Britain's number one celebrity couple. James Hunt was the nation's most eligible bachelor, once again. Hunt had signed to drive for the McLaren team, but that wasn't the story. How do you feel about Burton? Well, I think he's jolly nice. Film star Richard Burton was dating his wife. The trouble is that I'm at a very critical stage of my career now. What really makes it quite difficult to lead a sensible a normal married life. I'm in a situation where I'm a man in a hurry. It was a fantastic summer. It was the summer of 76. It was as hot, as hot, as hot. It never rained. The sun shone. The girls wore in little low clothes. Pop music was an ascendancy. Barry was, you know, winning races. James was winning races. While Sheen set the motorcycling pace, and it's a win for Barry Sheen. Hunt's pursuit of the Formula One world title spanned six of the most compelling months in Grand Prix history. There would be controversy and disaster. The, next came apart, isn't it? the priesthood, a bevy of BA stewardesses, and the British fans would play key supporting roles. Starring alongside Hunt was the defending champion, Nicky Lauder. James called Nicky the rat. What is fuck treat? The brilliant Austrian led the standings. Then in Germany, Lauder's Ferrari crashed and exploded into flames. Lauder was so badly burned he was given just a 5% chance of survival. The nurse asked me if I wanted a priest, and I said, you know, I couldn't say anything, so I just... He didn't say one word to me, just came, gave me the last rites, and left. My heart started beating again when I realised. This is a demonstration of how different these people are. I mean, Nicky Lauder had had the last rites read to him, because he was nigh unto death. Six weeks after the event, he was back at Monza and he had to have a special crash helmet made and when he took his helmet off it was full of blood. As James said, he was the only bloke that could get half his face burned off and come out better looking. <laughs> he was definitely destined to be a world champion. My dad said that when he was born. He told everyone he'd had a son who was going to be a world champion. <laughs> Mr Sheen's prophecy proved correct. In 76, Barry reigned supreme, winning the Swedish Grand Prix to clinch his first 500cc world title. Stephanie took the trophy home to England. Sheen flew to Japan to support Hunt's bid to make British sporting history. In Tokyo, he was deep into his pre-race routine. He had a lovely time because the hotel we were staying in was the hotel where KLM and British Airways overnighted. So every morning there was a whole bevy of new girls. 
And James was able to bounce over and say, hello, I'm James Hunt. They'd all say, oh yeah, we know who you are. <laughs> you can't get up to much trouble in Japan. Just a few geisha girls or whatever, I suppose. <laughs> Proper morning preparation. <laughs> Barry got sick and he was in bed for a day or two. Well, that's his story anyway. Hunt or ladder? Fame changes everybody. Don't play me my life. Love a bit of trumpet. The quality of hell raising has gone down. Jane was arguing for no race. This vital race right after the break. James Hunt's father had not approved of his son's career choice. the most memorable climax of a Grand Prix season for over 10 years. But in the early hours of Sunday, October the 24th, Mr. Wallace Hunt was eager to toast a world title triumph. How long have we got on the break? Do you want a swig, mate? Mm. Mm, what a good idea. This is the big one. It doesn't sound like my dad to carry a hip flask, so um, if he was, then he was definitely feeling the strain. The weather was absolutely appalling. The circuit was literally awash. Still suffering nightmares from his near-fatal crash, Nicky Lauda wanted the race abandoned. So did James Hunt. It now emerges McLaren had to force their driver, on the brink of the world title, to go to the start line. Well, that's news to me. I hadn't heard that story, but it doesn't entirely surprise me. It was raining like mad, and James was on the safety committee of the Grand Prix Drivers Association. They were arguing for no race. And of course, I was arguing, we've got to have the race, because we can't win the World Championship if we don't have a race. James is arguing for no race. No race. I didn't know that, but I'm not surprised to hear it, because the course was suicidal. You know, it's easy when you're sitting on the grid to suddenly get a premonition. And you mustn't think about it. If, if something like that comes into your head, the first thing you've got to do is get rid of it. So what do you think got James to the start line in the end? Sounds like Caldwell did. <laughs> One other incident played its part. Hunt needed a distraction from the mounting tensions. He found it. Patrick Head wandered into a garage by mistake, thinking it empty. He was surprised to find James Hunt inside with his racing ovals down round his ankles and a young Japanese girl kneeling in front of him. Hunt laughed when he saw him, but head hummed and hardened, quickly left in a daze, not quite believing what he had seen. And they're off! At 4pm in the gathering gloom, the Japanese Grand Prix began. One lap later, Lauda quit, calling the race suicide. James Hunt, twitching, almost out of control. I shouldn't speak ill of the dead, but I was really annoyed with James because we had a sign that said cool tyres and we showed this to him and he didn't react. In the end we were showing him nothing else, but he still did not respond. Why? I don't know. I never discussed it with him. I never discussed I was so angry with him. It may not have been that easy to see a pit ball every time, but equally, yeah, James being disobedient, what's near? With just four laps to go, Hunt finally obeyed team orders. Look at that, right front tyre, no tread on it at all. And the other one is flat. The McLaren left the pit lane in fifth. Hunt needed to finish third to be world champion. Hunt going past Alan Jones. That assures him of third place. We were lucky and so was he. Our new world champion, James Hunt, by just one single point. When he finished, he didn't realise that he'd finished third and thereby had become world champion. Though his pit board had nothing on it but P3, third, which is the right position. Give me a drink, give me a drink, give me a drink. James, Thank you. Did we really win? Well, he'd sportsman could be asked to do. He didn't choke and he delivered on the day. Having been a choker at times earlier in his career, he'd finally delivered in the toughest possible circumstances. Soon after the race, we managed to get James Hunt on the line from Tokyo. From half distance onwards, I knew... James Hunt became Britain's sixth Formula One world champion. Well, the family celebrations have actually started, have they not? <laughs> <laughs> Somehow or another, I think we'll have a, a rather more eventful Sunday than we usually do. To half the world, it probably meant that this is terrific. The other half, well, God, what's he going to do, frankly? 
And can I just finally ask you, what are your immediate plans now? I shall be getting drunk. There's much more to being world champion than riding a bike. Very tired and somewhat hungover, thank you very much. <laughs> what was the party like? It was long, <laughs> but good. Britain's Sports Personality of the Year for 1976 was ice skater John Curry. Come on, lad. His Olympic gold medal attracted the purest vote. Thank you. The world of celebrity awaited Hunt and Sheen. He was the first of the glamorous world champions. There was George Best in football and James Hunt in cars and Barry in bikes, and they were the three, weren't they? Long-haired, good-looking womanizers. <laughs> in fact, my sister dated James for about three weeks, and one of her friends said to her, you and your sister are going out with the two fastest men in Britain. <laughs> Oh, it was a big honour to be on. This is your life. This is your life with Eamon Andrews. I'd club to... Barry Sheen, MBE, tonight, this is your life. <laughs> I think fame changes everybody. It has to. I saw him more as a ballet dancer. Oh, you're kidding me. <laughs> <laughs> And he was mixing with the so-called jet set, I suppose, yeah. Former Beatle George Harrison is a fan and a friend. George Harrison came along to watch the racing 76, 77. Oh, it's George, is it? Yeah. They love Barry Sheen. They like the gung-ho world that he lived in. Yeah, and don't forget the Packamax for the, uh, you know... <laughs> the Starstruck. He definitely made it then, yeah, when the Beatle knows who you are. <laughs> He liked being in the public eye and people knowing who he was. It was a buzz for him, I think. There was some kind of James Hunt night at the Albert Hall I went to once. You're very fond of blowing your own trumpet, aren't you? But again, he dug a duck to water. He played his trumpet in the Albert Hall and everyone loved it. I'm sure it wasn't that virtuoso, but it was good enough. Nicky Loder. Wanted to say a special thank you to Pat, Jean, Mary, <laughs> Nelly, <laughs> Chantel, Deirdre, Gina, Bridget and Raquel. Without whose help, James Hunt would have won many more Grand Prix. I'm sorry, I haven't... I have, I, you'll have to excuse me if I break down. I haven't done it before, but I really... I don't know that I, I can do it, quite honestly. His behaviour at times was outrageous and, you know, deplorable. Uh, but somehow, he had a charm and a naughty schoolboy element that attracted the inner naughty schoolboy or schoolgirl in all of us, I think. Can I stop there? <laughs> Very difficult. <laughs> Anybody got any questions? Isn't everybody's idea in life is to have sort of fun with what they're doing? And, I, and they decided they were going to. I think the thing that attracted me most to Barry was uh, Stephanie. <laughs> <laughs> it was more of a learning curve to see what they could get away with, in a way. <laughs> I was particularly thrilled with David Wilkes' win for Britain in the Olympic Games. <laughs> David has nothing to worry about from me in the swimming stakes. My uh, swimming s instructor once told me that I swam like a brick. At least I think that was what he said. <laughs> Barry and James worked the circuit superbly. Mr. Barry Sheen. For both, it was about making every second count, because on every chat show, in every interview, one issue was never far away. What about crashing? What's the closest you've been to death? You've been nearer to death than I have. 
Yes. That could happen again. Yes. You know, motor racing is a dangerous business and I want to get my results, grab my money and run before I get hurt. The first year I raced in 1968, there were 22 cars on the grid at the first race at Hockenheim, and of those 22 drivers, three were dead by July. And that went all through the 70s. It was horrific. During James Hunt's Formula One career, 12 drivers were killed, and many more seriously injured. Every year, two guys died, and if you say you have a career of 10 years and uh, you have 24 drivers, you can calculate when it's your time. And fire was the biggest fear for all of them. Being killed instantly in an in impact is fine relative to burning to death. It's my life that's at stake. If they want to go and risk their own, tell them to go and do it somewhere else, but don't play with my life. During Sheen's peak years, 41 riders were killed in action. He spent much of his career lobbying for improved safety. I know it was dangerous, but I didn't really realise how dangerous until we were at a race in Belgium. We used to sit on this wall, um, timekeeping, they'd come round, and this bike came round the corner and just without a rider, and it just went into the wall like that and it scraped down the wall and it sliced off people's legs. But eight people got killed. That's when you sort of think, oh, wow, you actually see it firsthand. That sort of destruction. I counted up and I lost probably about 25, 30 mates. I'm not talking about people I knew, but mates that got killed in motorcycle racing and it just happened. But we just cast it aside, and we never went to funerals either. Couldn't go to funerals, because that would definitely put you off. There were no safe circuits, and we used to lose a driver a year, pretty much. Some years, more than one. Nobody in a position of influence should allow that to happen. As president of Formula One's governing body, the FIA, Max Mosley oversaw a transformation in safety standards. Since 1993, there have been two fatalities in Formula One and three in Grand Prix motorcycling. The pursuit of safety now keeps pace with the need for speed. I personally feel that there's danger added to what we were doing. I think it's one of the reasons for doing it. Nowadays, of course, the risks are far less. I mean, it would really be very unfortunate for a person to be killed today. I don't think they could unless something from another car hit you, hit a person. There comes a point where if motorcycle racing isn't dangerous, then who's going to want to watch it? The whole ethos of the racing is that you're meant to keep it between the white lines, not hit the arm curve, because you'll get hurt. Now, you know, if you're a young hooligan, you can just charge into somebody and you just get out and walk off down the road feeling a bit sore. Safety's great, but I think it's vastly overrated. Uh, People who say that have probably never been there when they've actually had to confront the death firsthand or had to tell somebody's father that his son is actually dead. Peterson, 38.6. It's great to talk about living on the edge and all the romance and so on. When somebody's actually dead, when you have to go to the funeral, and it usually would be a beautiful summer afternoon. It's some... Um, you can think of person after person after person. You can have a wonderful party with the people who got killed. Ronnie Peterson's death, at the end of 78, had a profound impact on James. It was James who plunged into the flames and pulled him out, so it was very first-hand experience how uh, it can all be over just like that. 
Hunt was blamed by some for causing the accident. He never fully recovered his passion for racing. The danger needed to be the drug, or what was the point? Considering James had his fair share of crashes, was he luckier than average not to be killed racing? Yes, probably. It was a completely different mind game than today. And you had to have big balls to do it. I remember when motor racing was dangerous and sex was safe. Now it's the other way around. <laughs> sex is dangerous and motor racing safe. They wanted the Playboy image. You couldn't get away with that now. Sports reporters had the secret. He produced lines of white powder. He had both of them. Can't hear you. Roll VTR. The relationship between sports star and journalists was much closer than it is today. Now, just a minute, I haven't done my hair yet. I'm not ready to go on the telly. Today, the sports star is surrounded by their advisors, and over there are the journalists gaining access, by the way, but controlled access through the image that they want to give off. So why don't you join us? I can't hear a bloody word on site. It was a much closer friendship between people, and in a way, I think they felt, the sports stars felt that they could trust certain journalists. Today, they might call it keeping your friends close and your enemies closer. James Hunt and Barry Sheen's working relationship with the media was rarely tactical. James, how much does this victory mean to you? Nine points, $20,000, and a lot of happiness. A degree of trust would guarantee access, sometimes to all areas. It all went very well. Feeling a bit sleepy? Yeah. You saw? Yeah. We still had a kind of agreement with, with, the, with the media to leave us our life in the way how we feel, even if it sometimes was a bit out of the frame. There was still a kind of respect, okay, that's private life. Sports reporters were considered very much part of the entourage. They had the secret. You know, the journalists got involved with what went on and there was a bit of cash and brown envelopes floating around. You know, sex, drugs and rock and roll. There was a bit of drugs going on and stuff like that, but it wasn't reported because everyone was part of the scene. We were in Rio and James said to me, do you mind if we stop at a friend's flat? And so we stopped this very beautiful building, went to the top where there's this amazing penthouse flat. A very nice man there. We all sit down and he produced a block of polished marble. And he then laid out on the marble three lines of white powder. And James, <laughs> James turned to me and he said, you don't want yours, Max, do you? And I said, no, no, I don't. And he had both of them and the other man had the third one. And then we went happily to the party. Did he ever go then to the start line under the influence? Be honest. I don't know, but it wouldn't astonish me. Everything depends on the finest judgment, particularly the lives of the other drivers, so it would be a very wrong thing to do, and maybe he never did. But? Who can be sure? And so finally to the sportsman of 1976. At their peak, Hunt and Sheen were earning huge sums in sponsorship deals. James Hunt! Britain's two world champions were represented by the PR agency, CSS. Linda Patterson was the press liaison. During their careers, Hunt's use of cocaine was never exposed. Can you give me a cigarette? Can I grab that cigarette off you? Thanks. Sheen's relationship with Stephanie was never jeopardised, and neither were their lucrative endorsements. Photographs, ladies and gents. Memories of the Costa Buava. The ad agencies were open to taking things differently. Why, a tick? Stone me, you're David Bailey, aren't you? No, no, I'm sorry, I'm not Bailey. Listen, I think you want me. Look, chum, I'm talking to the engineer, not the oily rag. They wanted something that was more cutting edge. They wanted the Playboy image. It was something that hadn't happened before, and it differentiated them from all the other brands that had gone down the straightforward route. 
good looking young lad, liked pretty girls, did all the things that everyone wanted to do. He was a hero, he was like a kid's hero. Like James Bond. Absolutely like James Bond, yeah, without, uh, well there was a seven in there as well of course. Daring, successful, attractive. Love it with a trumpet. Hunt and Sheen were adored by advertisers. For the aspirational man of the 70s, Playboy was the role model. That's what I call flying the flag. We moved into a time when it was a lot of fun. Splash it all over. Splash it all over, eh, Henry? Lovely way to freshen up. The Brute commercial was huge, absolutely huge. Yeah, but I wear it for a better reason. What's that? She I like it. It. <laughs> it was like the adoring woman fawning over the man. It wasn't a case of getting away with it, it's just the way we things were done. <laughs> James did Texaco. Oh, hello, James. <laughs> How's it going, boys? With Morecambe and Wise. <laughs> what time does the match begin? The race starts in five minutes. Ah, oh, the man has to start without Chip and Wise. And he was the chauffeur. <laughs> what about a tip, then? Held his hand out for a tip at the end of it. Leave the woman alone. <laughs> that never happened. Trackside or on set, Hunt and Sheen rarely modified their behaviour for anybody especially the sponsors who were paying them. Oh, James, for the second time this year, you managed pole. How do you do it? I just jump in and give it assholes, you know. There you go. Okay. Give it assholes. Barry was absolutely besotted with Stephanie and was jealous if Stephanie wasn't around, but was quite happy to be with other women. But it wasn't necessarily bedding. I mean, with Barry, it was quick man in the corner or something because he just knew that he could get away with it. I mean, some of the sponsors even realised what he was doing, and of course they were proud of him. They were similar age, and they were a bit jealous, I think, in a way. Did Barry get away with it? Almost probably, yeah. Yeah, I never found out about any of his dalliances. If he had any, I'm sure he did when I wasn't around. But, but all men do, don't they? Now you know why he's been world champion two years running. Barry sold the iconic brand but didn't buy it. Of course, I alter my Brute 33. Go on, Steph, splash it all over. God, he'd go mad if you just splashed that all over him. Nothing beats the great smell of Brute. We used to have bucket... I suggest you ask a positive question or I'll move on. Don't talk about that. My phone is being tapped. He had to fight his own demons with drink and drugs. What are you allergic to? Cancer. <laughs> I'd like to tell you about the Vauxhall range. What I really go for in today's Vauxhalls is their sleek new look. Sports marketing has come a long way since the 1970s. Why don't you take a Vauxhall for a test drive? Today, it's a global industry built on multinational brand names. Action. Television commercials command feature film budgets. The launch of a new campaign can be a worldwide event. At the epicenter is the star athlete. We want heroes. We want people to be better than they, they are. You have big many factors into the sport, but they are also having a very clear mind what they expect from you. If you want now being in the game, you have to, to, to play a certain role. That sometimes cuts a little bit your wings. I'm just excited to get in the car. Both teams are what they win the match. This thing's happening in football. As I've said all along, it's no easy game. Boy's done a fantastic job. Lost for words, to be honest with you. I don't see why. You can't have personality and be a star, but the people that are around them, every time you say anything that veers off the straight and narrow, an apology has to be given. Why don't they just turn around and say, well, I'm not apologising? We've already done it. We haven't. Um, wait out. Those that surround them say, for God's sake, don't say anything. Or if you are going to say anything, saying, oh, he'll be disappointed in that. I'm a professional football player, I love playing football, um, I enjoy it, so, um, and I want to win every game, so... I suggest you ask a positive question or I'll move on. If I listen to any more of that, I think I'll die. Right. What you don't know is, for every story I break, there's ten I stop. You see him here, you see him there, you see Max Clifford everywhere these days. For 40 years, Max Clifford has been Britain's most influential figure in the world of celebrity PR. 70% of his work now revolves around protecting, not promoting, the careers of his clients, especially his growing list of sports stars. Right, we start again from here, if you want. Right, ready? 
if you want sponsorship, if you want to be advertising, if you want to be making endorsements, it's not just sufficient to be a great footballer. You've also got to be seen to be nice and kind. That's one of the reasons why PR people like myself make a fortune from protecting major sports stars because you know it's very difficult for anybody to live up to the kind of perception that um, <laughs> they need to. Well done, Rooney. What we at Nike say is that we amplify the voice of the athlete. Turn over! You want something about them that makes them stand out. An element of rebel spirit is great as well, something that makes them uh, not afraid to buck the trend. I'm sure there are good examples of people who've had a, an image entirely manufactured in sport, but I can't think of many. Can I ask you about Tiger Woods? Yeah. In 1996, the day after he turned professional, Nike signed a $40 million sponsorship deal with a golfer who had been singled out for greatness since the age of two. Golden Boy. Perfect. 13 years and 14 major titles later, Tiger Woods' portfolio of endorsement contracts totaled an estimated $100 million a year. And then, of course, we found a fatal flaw. He was banging cocktail waitresses too at a time, two beautiful children, all going so well, and then... I was unfaithful. I had affairs. I cheated. This is what then leads to high court cases and big scandals. When the image and the reality are different, an explosion is going to happen, and there will be a tremendous fallout. Any long-term partnership is going to go through ups and downs, rough and smooth. We are a brand that built ourselves on athletes, and I don't think it would be appropriate for us to you know, cut and run every time an athlete faces an individual issue. By all means, be Tiger Woods, but don't be married. Come on, lad. This summer, Coca-Cola ended one of its sponsorship deals with England striker Wayne Rooney after revelations about his private life. In January, Chelsea captain John Terry failed to win an injunction preventing the publication of allegations of an affair. The judge ruled Terry was trying to protect his commercial interests. Yeah, I know. If you use the media for your own ends, to promote yourself, to make money, etc., you can't complain too much when the media uses you. I don't blame them for that. I don't blame them for that. I blame the people around them. Just two questions each. Just one word. What would Barry make of all these publicists and media managers who surround top sports stars today? Well, he'd definitely be shagging the secretaries. <laughs> I went round the side, avoiding it, and somebody hit me up the arse. What people think is acceptable, I guess, of, of sports stars has changed. And what was once seen with a sort of, you know, nudge and a wink and laddish indulgence, maybe you couldn't get away with that now. <laughs> I think any player or athlete these days who behave like those guys do would have a short career. Next year, Max Mosley will petition the European Court of Human Rights to introduce a law forcing newspapers to inform subjects before publishing stories about their private lives. Opponents claim it would be a major blow to press freedom. In years to come, there will be less privacy because it's what the public wants. They want to know about what the rich and famous are getting up to, and that's the masses. For all that I have done, I am so sorry. Does anybody really care? I mean, if I read something and it says that he shagged some girl whilst his wife was away or whatever, I just don't think anything of that. I just think, well, don't they all? James and Barry had no barrier around. Happy birthday, James! Because they didn't want it. We're pulling the wrong bit. Hang on. Whereas the modern Formula One driver, they have a wall, and at that wall they, they won't go outside. The press love a character, and the public do too, that's interesting, not some faceless automaton that gets in the car and performs and gets out again with nothing to say. Tell us what happened. No, this is a race okay. going on here, boy. It's a pity. But that's what you get when the money takes over. When the race finishes, instead of chasing girls as we did in my day, now they go and say thanks to Vodafone. Really, you've got a pretty face. <laughs> Thank you.
James Hunt's Formula One career ended where it began, in Monte Carlo. At the 1979 Monaco Grand Prix, Hunt walked away from the sport he had conquered just three years earlier. Some of his lovely friends sucked all his money out of him, so he ended up quite poor. Certainly there were strains. There were marital strains and there were his own demons with drink and drugs he had to fight. So clearly it wasn't all plain sailing. Barry Sheen's racing legend stretched to one final unforgettable chapter. Sheen was testing for the 1982 British Grand Prix at Silverstone. Barry came over a blind brow. Straight into the... I didn't go to the scene of the accident. I was convinced in my own mind that he was dead. And the X-ray photographs of Barry's legs with multiple nails and pins and clamps was front page news. Hi, Barry. How are you doing? That was his thing, you know, the bionic man. If you want to show us your legs in the cold, uh, Barry, we'll be delighted to see them. Right, hang on. hold this, Wally. <laughs> We've ended up with this little museum of our own here. This is my dining room, actually, believe it or not. Barry retired to start a new life in Australia at Surfers Paradise. Unlike James, he was very careful with his money. Everybody gets a bad deal on the tax, for whether you're earning £10 a week or £100,000 a week or year. He was about to leave the country, and I got a phone call saying, you'll never guess what, the taxman's investigating me, they're after Lester Piggott, they're after this, they're after that. And I said, well, I remember going and picking up some money on your behalf, cash, at one particular race. And he said, don't, don't, stand by your facts, stand by your facts, don't, put the phone down. And this fax came through and it says, Linda, for sake, don't talk about that, my phone is being tapped. So um, I was told off completely and Barry was convinced that every single phone that he had was being bugged at that time. But I've kept this because I just felt it was a, it was a piece of history as far as I was concerned. And it said a lot about him as well. I'm terrified of dying because I'm having a jolly good time down here. Total shock, because he hadn't been ill. And no one had a clue it was coming. So yeah, out of the blue completely. In 1993, James Hunt suffered a fatal heart attack. He was 45. And what about Sheen, aged 50? Well, <laughs> geriatric. <laughs> or what's left of Sheen, aged 50? Well, I should be there when I'm 50, I should think. He knew there was something wrong because he just started to lose weight and um, he went to the doctor and they looked down and found that he'd, um, he'd got cancer with the esophagus. Yeah. There is an operation that you can have. He didn't want the operation. Yeah, it was his choice. He always had a bit of a sense of humour, even when he went to hospital for the last time before he died. The nurse got him comfortable and she said, are you allergic to anything, Mr Sheen? And he said, yeah, cancer. What are you allergic to? Cancer. <laughs> Barry Sheen died in 2003, aged 52. Would he have compromised who he was to reach the top today? Probably, when you see the rewards on offer, and if he knew he had the talent, he'd probably say, sod it, I'll have to, I'll have to wear shoes until I'm world champion. He wouldn't have been politically correct like, like they all are now, because Barry wasn't politically correct in most things he did. James, he was extraordinary, uh, it's extraordinary. I suppose if you go to the very, very top category, you would have to say that he was a might have been, because he could have been more than he was probably, but then he wouldn't have been James. We haven't had a top level world champion since Barry Sheen, 33 years ago. What would you make of that? He'd love it. 
<laughs> he loved that, he did. It remains the only year Britain has crowned champions in Formula One and 500cc motorcycling. 1976, when Playboys ruled the world. There's a lovely picture of him sitting on the side of the car at Silverstone with his hat on a skew, smoking a fag, with a girl with a bright gold jumpsuit on next to him, looking quite bemused but expectant. <laughs> This fan here, I don't know whether you can see it, it says Barry Sheen is a wanker. And he thought that was great, and so he had it framed. <laughs> you have to have that sort of stuff just to remind you who you are every now and then. Let's hope you bring the championship back, Barry. Well, if I don't, it won't be for the lack of trying, I can promise you. Hello, Dickie. <laughs> the reason the Hunts and the Sheens endure is because they were real people living real lives and allowing us into them. Heroes, personalities, somebody that people like, somebody that people would like to be like. How do you do it? Big balls. <laughs> the reason those characteristics have always been popular is that most of the rest of us would quite fancy to be a bit like that in our dreams, but we haven't got the nerve. From swashbuckling pirates right the way through, that's what most of us aspire to, and that's why it still works in the movies, it still works in books, and it still holds our attention.